Our scripture reading is Psalm 105. We'll be reading verses 1 through 11 at this time. Verses 1 through 11 of Psalm 105. Hear God's own true and eternal word. O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people, sing unto Him, sing psalms unto Him, talk ye of all His wondrous works, glory ye in His holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord, seek the Lord and His strength, seek His face evermore. Remember his marvelous works, that he hath done his wonders, and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. Thus far in the reading of God's holy word. And now we again... I invite you again to open your Bibles in Psalm 105 as we hope to consider the psalm before us. Our theme is Jehovah's truth shall stand forever. This is a psalm, especially from verses 5 through 11, um, that we sing in our Psalter every single baptism. At the end of the baptism, that is the psalm that we love to go to. It's it's not a mandate that we do so, but it's just a psalm that contains the very message that we're being reminded regarding baptism, especially these verses, verses 5 on. I'll read a few verses. Remember His marvelous works that He hath done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, His servant, ye children of Jacob, His chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered His covenant forever. The word which He commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant He made with Abraham, and his oath unto Isaac. Now, the reason we baptize is because we are going as far back to Genesis 17, where God told Abraham to give the sign of the covenant to every single male in his home, including himself and, and whatever babies would be in that family. And and I, will, and I will explain why we do not give that same sign, but we, we give the sign of baptism. Baptism is always a moment that we are to remember things. It is a sacrament, which means it is a memorial. We are remembering things of the past, and we're remembering promises for the future. And, and why this psalm is, the reason why this psalm is so precious is that it's telling us to do that, It is telling us to remember His marvelous works, but it's also telling us to remember that God is a God who remembers. Because that is also a key thing regarding a covenant. God makes a covenant with us. We are to keep that covenant, but God is promising that He will keep it as well. And we are being told in this psalm to remember that God will keep it, and we are being told to remember to keep it. And what is it that we need to keep? We need to keep the faith. Believing that God never forgets. In summary, that's our part, is to believe. 
And it is by believing that this psalm even becomes very personal in our hearts. And, and this is what I mean. In our, in our first point, as we look at the seed of Abraham, as we have it in our first point, um, we realize that this involves not only the seed of Abraham in an in a ethnic kind of way, but we have Bible portions that make it very clear that the seed of Abraham is to be understood in a spiritual way, which makes it where we understand that this psalm is to us, it is to you if you are a believer. When it says, O ye seed of Abraham, of, of course it does mean and signify any Israelite, anyone who would have come out of Abraham, are called and, and, and invited to remember these things. But we have passages in God's Word that we're reminded that, that, yes, the Israelites were being called as a people, but God never intended for the truth to just be a secret for the Israelites. The Israelites were to be, we, we saw a couple Sundays ago, they were, in a sense, to be an evangelist to the whole world, a light to the whole world, that we all would believe in the God of the Jews, who is the true God, Jehovah. And... Look at Galatians 3, verses 6 through 9. This is um, what Paul wrote to the Galatians. The Galatians were, there were some Israelites in that congregation, but the mass majority were Gentile people, people from the Greek world and from the surrounding nations. And he says there, Galatians 3, 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness... Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So they that are of faith, just as Abraham believed, well, that became a model whereby anyone from any nation who was to believe would become then a child of Abraham. And Abraham was being chosen as like a representative, what we would call a covenant head. And verse 8 continues of Galatians 3. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, those are all the other nations surrounding Israel, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And so what this means is that this history that we're hoping to look at we will be reading portions of this psalm that we haven't read yet. But we'll be following through and, and seeing what we are to remember. And the way I want us to understand this is this, that this is our history. If you are someone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your history. This is where it all began. Um, uh, commentator Derek Kidner said, Here are the early chapters of our own story. We can sing of its miraculous beginnings with more than a spectator's interest. Yes, someone who's looking at the history of the Israelites from the outside and does not believe in the God of the Jews and does not believe in the Messiah that was sent, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are watching that history from the sides but the Bible teaches that if you believe then in the very Messiah that was sent through this very Abraham, then you are a child of Abraham. And when it says, O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen, it is calling you, believer, to sing in this way and to remember these things. And it's inviting, again, all others to believe and to then be part of this very psalm. And you are called to remember as well. And so let us go to our second point where we will consider the covenant God remembered. This psalm is declaring that God remembered. Notice this. It says in verse 5, Remember His marvelous works. That's the mandate for us. We are called to remember. But then, if you go to verse 8, it says, He hath remembered His covenant forever. So we are called to remember, but we are being told that He has remembered. And, and what is it that He remembered? What is it that He did? Look at verse 11. The last verse that we read first says, saying, Unto thee will I give thee 
Give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. Now, there were many more promises that God gave to Abraham. And through the years, he repeated some of those promises to Jacob, to Isaac, and then to Jacob, to all of his people. But this psalm is singling out one promise alone. And it's like that promise will serve as a proof for all the others. And even though the others are not delineated here, we see that they are answered as well. I'll I'll share what those promises are shortly. But this is the promise that this psalm is telling us to remember. God promised He would give a land to His people. And then look at the very last part of this psalm, verse 42. It says, For He remembered His holy promise and Abraham his servant, and he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness and gave them the land of the heathen, and they inherited the labor of the people. And that's when they finally entered Canaan and became the possessors of that land. That's the land that's referred to as the promised land. It is the land of Palestine even today where the majority of Israel is located. So God gave the promise that He would give them a land and this psalm ends by saying He gave the land. And everything that's in between is going in that trajectory. And that's what what we're hoping to see um, shortly. But before we, we look at the next verses in this psalm where we see this history... Let me give you the other promises that God gave, and I'll say later where, where, where God gave those promises, which, which really helps when you understand a little bit of the geography and a little bit of the, of the narrative, the history. It, you put yourself in Abraham's sandals, and, and, it, and it really becomes very emphatic. So God did say He would give a land, but then He, would, he also said that Abraham would become a great nation, that he would be a great people. You, you, you have to imagine how that was hard for Abraham because for many, many years, even in his late 90s, there was absolutely no children between him and Sarah. And so to know that he would be a great nation was only possible by faith. He had to believe God by His Word. And he... He had some moments of difficulties that we'll look at. Also, the promise was that he would be blessed by God. Giving giving a land was part of that blessing, but there would be other blessings. God would bless him. And also that his name would be great. And also that he would be a great blessing. That Abraham would be a great blessing to the nations. You might remember also how God put it. Um, Anyone who would curse Abraham would be cursed. And anyone who would bless bless Abraham would be blessed. That's a wonderful protection, isn't it? And anyone who would would maybe hear of these blessings and see that maybe that was happening would be somewhat afraid of touching that family. But these were the promises. But let, let us look now at the psalm itself. And we will see that even as we see a a connection of the history and the narrative, we can group up some of these ways that God was remembering before He gave the land. We see how God was was so graciously caring for His people. And it begins with verse 12. It says, When they were but a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it, When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another. So these are the sad things about them. They're very few. They are strangers. They are pilgrims. They're immigrants. Those are all hard things for a person, for a family. And then verse 14. He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do not Do my prophets no harm. All these verses that I just read, you can put under the heading of protection. This was God protecting Abraham. 
there, there were moments where we see precisely what these verses are saying. Remember, when, when there was famine in the land, there were two events where Abraham thought he had to go far, and so first he went to Egypt, and when he was in Egypt, that's when there was that incident where, where people, the, the uh, Potiphar, and, um, Pharaoh himself thought that Sarah was a beautiful um, lady, and Abraham, remember, said that she was a sister, and so Pharaoh felt the freedom to take her. And then God sent a plague to Pharaoh's house. Yes, this was a plague even before Moses' time had the plague, hundreds of years before. And when Pharaoh understood that it was because he took Sarah, he immediately gave her back and even reproved Abraham for not having told him because he wouldn't have done that if he knew she was his wife. But you see God's protection there. And this was repeated in Gerar. It was repeated because Abraham faltered again, said she was a sister. The king of Gerar took her. And in that case, God appeared in a dream to that king, Abimelech, and told him to return Sarah to Abraham. And so this psalm is, is very literal when it says, saying, verse 15, Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. God even told Abimelech and said, He's my prophet. He will do a sacrifice for you so that you're forgiven for what you've done. So this was the protection that Abraham was under. God had promised a land. The land is not yet his, but God is going in that direction. Protection. The next word that we have in verse 16 of this psalm is the word provision. Notice why why I choose this word. In verse 16 it says, Moreover, God, meaning He he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. That's when there came a famine. Um, it, It was another one, not the one I just talked about. Verse 17, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters, He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king, now this is Pharaoh, sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. This this is a few verses, but this is um, dozens of years in history. There was a famine. Jacob now, um, he is the grandson of Abraham. He, He has his 12 sons. And remember that Joseph was the youngest and his brothers were all jealous of Joseph. There was that day they decided, let's just throw him in the pit. And they did so. And remember, they were going to let him there, leave him there to die. And yet one said, no, let's not do this. And Reuben didn't want to. He had a plot to come and snatch him and protect his life. But when they saw a group of people, um, those travelers that were, were going towards Egypt, they had the thought of selling their own brother. Think of what wickedness to do to a, to a brother. But you heard the psalm. It said that God sent Joseph ahead of them. This is so, such a beautiful lesson here of God's providence. There can be, even in our minds, what looks like a calamity, but in God's sovereignty, if He promised protection, He will. And so He's providing for all of Egypt and even for His people for food. Because then remember, when, when Joseph comes forth out of the prison, he, he gives the counsel to Pharaoh that what his dream means is that there will be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine and that during these seven years he better um, provide and, and build the granaries and, and keep food for the seven years of the famine. And because of Joseph and his counsel, Egypt survived that seven-year famine. And it was so great that the surrounding lands had the famine too. Jacob heard that there was food in Egypt. Little did he know it was because his own son was like a lord in the land. And finally he receives the report that he can go to Egypt. He will see his son This is what the psalm contains a little bit of in in verse um, 21. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. Israel also came. This means Jacob, the father of Joseph. 
Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. I always loved as a little child seeing that in Sunday school of that father who thought his son was killed many years before, finally sees him. And he's not only alive, he's the second one in command in all of Egypt. So majestic. The next heading we have, so we have protection, provision, and now thirdly, in just a few verses, we have prosperity. So this people that God has promised to protect and to give them one day a land, okay, they still don't have the land, but God is protecting them in this other land. And just a few verses here, verse 23 shows that Jacob is now in Egypt, and verse 24 says, and he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. They became so strong that, look at verse 25, he turned their hearts to hate his people to deal subtly with his servants. The Israelites became so numerous that God's promise that they would become a great nation was so truly coming to fruition that now they are a danger to the Egyptian people. And that's, of course, what starts that new period in the history of God's people where they became um, slaves in Egypt. So protection, provision, prosperity. But even now, as the people of Egypt, the people of God are now slaves in Egypt, which is, in a sense, the greatest sadness. Even though Abraham um, was a pilgrim, he was free. Even though Isaac was just roaming through the land, he, he, he was prospering. And even Joseph came as a slave to Egypt. Well, it was to provide for all the people. But now they're slaves, and it's turning into 400-some years. You read in Exodus, you, you almost hear, if you're a little child, you hear those scourges and those whips of the slave masters making them make bricks and without straws. And that's how the people were now. And anyone could look and say, I heard something about the promises for this people. They don't have a land. They're, they're numerous, but their little baby boys are dying in the River Nile. We are the people, in a sense, cursing them, but we're not being cursed. Where's their protection? Where's their provision? And then our psalm, this is the greatest part of the psalm. In verse 26, it says, He sent Moses. And from verse 26, you could say all the way to verse 36, 10 verses. The word that I could come for this could be the word power. God showed a display of his sheer, divine, sovereign, unparalleled power. Every verse is saying what God did. See, this people, they were slaves in a nation that was very powerful. They were able to subdue them. And they were able to bring that mandate that every baby boy was to be thrown in the river. You would think a people like that have no hope. A people like that might as well just, just submit to this sad predicament. But no. Look what the psalm reads. So Moses was sent. Verse 28. He sent darkness. Verse 29. He turned their waters into blood. Verse 36, 40, 31. Um, he spake, and there came devised sorts of flies and lice in all their coasts. Verse 32, he gave them hail for rain. Verse 33, he smote their vines also. Verse 34, he spake, and the locusts came, and caterpillars, and that without number. Verse 36, he smote also the firstborn of their land. So that's what God does. Didn't he promise Abraham? Those who curse you, I will curse. It seems like if, if, if they were cursed in a very great way, well, then the curse will be in a great way too. You know, to make a whole people slaves, that's a very big, sinful way to deal with the people. And this is what we have, the power of God displayed. And then, verse 37, we have a new we could have a new heading here. And see, these are all ways that God is proving that He remembers before He gives the land. Protection, provision, power, prosperity. And now verse 37 starts 
this little theme, deliverance. The theme of deliverance. Look what it says. Um, verse 37, He brought them forth also with silver and gold. This verse almost sounds like it's not in the right place. They were slaves. Yes, but if you read all the verses of what God did and what God sent, they are now delivered. They are brought forth even with silver and gold. There was not one feeble person among their tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them fell upon them. And what we have is a few more verses showing how God provided for them. And, and, and I would say that verse 39 is one more heading still. It's the heading of guidance, or you could say direction. God doesn't just deliver the people and tell them, now, now go where you want to. No, He guides them. And, and you read in verse 40, no, verse 39, He spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light in the night. Uh, and beloved, I, I remember even as a child listening to this and thinking, isn't this exactly what we would want in a wilderness, in a desert? A cloud during the day to cover that strong sun that would beat and hurt us. And in the night, you know how deserts are cold at night, but it's also dark, but there would be a pillar of light. God was guiding them every day and every night. Have you noticed? Protection, provision, prosperity, power, deliverance. And then he provides water from the rock and bread from heaven and the quails throughout the wilderness. And then verse 42 that we began with. He remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness and gave them the land of the heathen. They got the land. They received the land. Why, why is God doing this? He's reminding us that he's a God who is true to his word. We just saw a sacrament that is telling us to do just that. To remember that God will be true to His Word. We baptize our babies because God's Word commands us. And we are to raise our babies in saying, God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus. And when He lived upon this life, He's the one who is the seed of Abraham in which the promise was to be ultimately fulfilled. And this is where I end with my third point, the covenant of God fulfilled. The covenant that God remembered, the covenant that God fulfilled. The psalm ends where the land was given to them because this is where the history was when the people, the the, the psalmist who penned this psalm was living in that day. But we have not given in a ceremonial way the sign of circumcision. We have given the sign of baptism. And this is communicating a great and grand event. We are communicating that we no longer need a sign in which there is shedding of blood because the Lord Jesus came to earth. He is the seed of Abraham who walked upon this earth and He took the sins of His people on the tree. Um, when we read a verse in Isaiah, it says that He was cut off out of the land of the living. And the word cut off there is the same word connected with circumcision, which was a form of cutting. So that when the Lord Jesus was, was crucified... He was fulfilling circumcision and every other sacrifice that was necessary, shedding of blood. God was saying, I no longer need any of those. The sins are not forgiven through a ram or through a lamb. It is forgiven by looking to Jesus and trusting that there on the cross He died for my sins. And when you believe that, that promise is to you 
and to your children. And you raise your children to look to Jesus, to trust Jesus. And then if any would doubt Jesus, we, we have this psalm to remind us and even more promises. I could even bring many more things that God has said and He was true to His Word. And there were promises that this Messiah would come and He did. And He lived upon this land. And I, I just want to finish by, by showing this one thing. We spoke of protection, we spoke of provision, we spoke of power, we spoke of deliverance, of prosperity, and we spoke of guidance. Can Jesus do any of that? Well, Jesus is the one who protects us from the greatest evil of all. The greatest evil in this world is not sickness, it is not poverty, it isn't even war. The, the Puritans would say also that the greatest even, the evil is not even death, nor hell, nor Satan. The greatest evil is sin. You could say, well, how, how can sin be even worse than Satan? Because Satan wouldn't exist if sin didn't exist. Sin is rebellion against God. See, if, if, if that didn't exist, there would be no Satan. And if there was no rebellion, there would be no need for hell, which is to punish sin. And without sin, there'd be no death. There'd be no suffering in the world. Sin is our greatest evil. And Jesus took that on the cross. He who knew no sin, we read in God's word, became sin for us. Jesus took the sins of his own on the cross so that when you believe in him, you are protected because you are forgiven. Sin will have no more danger in your life that will cause condemnation. Sin will still cause a grief Sin always does cause a grief. There's a funny noise, right? I'm wondering if it's something of the buttons here. Sin will always do that. But if you're safe in Jesus, you're protected from sin's ultimate destruction. And, and this, is, this is what's so marked about the gospel. Jesus on the cross was not protected. He took sin upon him so that we could be protected. He was a holy man. He never had to die. It is the wages of sin that is death. Jesus had no sin. He didn't have to die, but he died voluntarily because he took our sins upon him. And God did not even protect him from his own wrath. But when you trust in Jesus, you are protected. Provision. We saw how God provided for his people. When you trust in Jesus, he provides you with life. He provides you with forgiveness. He provides you with a new heart. He provides you with the hope of heaven. He provides you with the Holy Spirit to indwell you. He provides you with Himself as a Father, with the Lord Jesus as an elder brother, and you become a co-heir with Him. And then this leads to prosperity. Can you become richer than this? Can you become richer than having eternal life and to be one who owns, as it were, because you're, you see, you're a co-heir of the Lord Jesus, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you walk upon those roads of gold that God's Word says, heaven is laid with, that is your home. God is your Father. There is no greater prosperity upon this earth and in the world beyond. Protection, provision, prosperity, and power. Well, it is the power of the cross that achieves all this. And, and, the, and Satan will try, sin will try to dissuade you, to make you think these things are too good to be true. In many ways, this is the great labor of a pastor is to preach the truth. And, and as, as you meet with people who say, but that sounds too easy. That sounds too true, too, too good. And this is what's so majestic about the gospel. It is good and it is true. You might meet in this world things that look too good to be true. And I cannot give my word for any of those things. But for God's word, 
we are being told in this very passage, and we see throughout hundreds of years that God kept His Word. And then you go to prophecies that said that He would be born in Bethlehem, and He was. That He would be pierced for our transgressions, and that's how He died. There are prophecies in Psalm that says that they would be playing games and rolling dice to see who would keep his garments. And that's what they did. There are prophecies that he would be spat upon and they did. That he would be scourged and he was. That he would be the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And there could be no eye that could look upon that Jesus and say he was not a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. See, the very rejection of Christ was fulfilling the prophecies that He was the true Messiah. The, the world sometimes hears of Jesus having died on the cross and say, well, He possibly couldn't be the Messiah. I heard they killed Him and He was taken out of this world. And, and precisely that's what qualifies Him as the Messiah. That is the prophecies. The prophecy said that He would die. That none of us would, would desire Him that we would scorn Him, that we would mock Him. Power, the power of the cross, protection, provision, prosperity, and deliverance. One look to the cross by faith and you are delivered from death and hell and all of its power forever. The deliverance of the greater sorts to to have been a slave in Egypt for a few years where it was not as bad as being without Christ for all of eternity. And when you know Christ, you have this certainty that there will be no slavery, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Spiritual slavery, I'm meaning. Deliverance. He delivers us. He delivers us even from ourselves. He delivers us from our laziness. He delivers us from our complaint. He delivers us from from our loathness to, to, to come to Him and to read the Bible. He delivers us into heaven itself. And then we saw that they were guided. And this is what we are. We open the Bible and He guides us. We we open this psalm and He's guiding us. In in this very sermon, there are elements of guiding. We're being guided to look to Jesus and all will be well. Train our precious babies to look to Jesus and they will meet the Savior of their souls. And I just end with this thought. As Abraham was even beginning his trek... We we looked at the promises most of this life, but let's go back with Abraham to Ur. Ur was right there, quite at the mouth of the Gulf, the Persian Gulf. It was a city of about 100,000 people. It wouldn't be a city that anybody would be wanting to leave, but that's where he began his trek, and God told him to go. And the way he had to travel to Canaan would have been the way of even today, following the the Tigris and Euphrates River all the way to modern-day Turkey and then taking directly south into Canaan. But in doing that, Abraham was literally going through, through the most prosperous and amazing places in that day that he could have gone. In his trek all the way to Canaan, it would have been almost from Maine all the way to Los Angeles. It was around 3,400 miles. But as Abraham is going on that trek, he is going through all of those cities that were full of what we call the ziggurats. He would have passed hundreds of them. And they were those edifices that would come. You know, that it was, everything was quite plain. But all of a sudden, there would be those giant buildings that would rise, sometimes hundreds of feet. And at the very pinnacle, there would be a shrine to the God of this place. And then he would walk two more weeks. And then another ziggurat, a God of this place. Sometimes a few days, another ziggurat and a God of that place. And as he traveled through Babylon and through Nineveh, he arrived in Haran. You remember how Haran is where Tira, his Um, The father of Lot died, and then he continued going um, all the way to Carchemish, and then he went south to Canaan. But that would have been impressed upon his mind. He would have taken the tour that probably 90% of the people never, ever did. And seeing all those ziggurats, like the religiosity of the whole fertile crescent... 
And in many of those places, like Babylon, there would have been a lot of the rituals going on. Each one of these nations claiming their gods, claiming a preference, claiming a greatness. If you travel there today, all of those ziggurats are piles of rubble, ruins, Their gods are largely forgotten. They're in the books of archaeology. They never seem to have blessed their people, not in ways that God promised and did, because they never were true gods. But you can imagine Abraham passing through the shades and shadows of those places and thinking, my God told me to go to a place I don't even know. It was when he got to Haran that God told him that he would be a great people, that God would make him a great blessing. And he had no sons. He was already 75. And then he arrived in Canaan. And then when he was 85, he still had no sons. That's when he faltered and thought he should have a son with Hagar. And it was right after that moment where Ishmael was born, where God even said... It won't be him. Maybe Abraham felt somewhat guilty. Chapter 17, God comes and says, I will make you a great nation. You will have a son. You will have a land. I will be your God and you will be my people. He renews the covenants again and he gives the sign of circumcision. Can you imagine how that must have felt for Abraham? The sins of my flesh will be cut away. Yes, it'll take bleeding, but there's forgiveness with this God. I broke the covenant because I doubted for a while, but God didn't kick me out of the covenant. And this is we find of the covenant blessings, which is so majestic. God never needs to be reminded. He never forgets. We need to remember. We need the memorials because we do. And for all the times that we break the covenant because we do not believe as we should, and then we sin, we flee to the same Christ who was sent by the Father to keep the covenant because we can't. Jesus is the covenant keeper. And in his perfect covenant keeping is where we live our lives. That is why one of the most blessed realities of the gospel is not only our sins are forgiven, but we receive the righteousness of Christ to cover all of our imperfections. Let us remember these truths. Let us remember these precious promises by looking to Jesus and not distrusting, but believing because Jehovah's truth shall stand forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God, how we thank Thee, Lord, for this glorious history of Thy people, of, the pro- of Thy providence in caring for thy people as a God who loves, who is all-powerful, who is sovereign, who even, Lord, when we forget and when we sin, thou art gracious and thou art good. Lord, we pray again that thou would bless Ariel and Keith to raise little Magnolia, to never forget these things, that that she would grow up and know so much of thy word and see thy provisions and see thy many blessings and that she would grow up learning and believing that thou art a God who is true to thy word. Help us all, Lord, to remember these truths. Help us to embrace Christ and to live by Christ. And we ask,